morning, God's beloved. Welcome to worship at Heart of the Rockies Christian Church, Disciples of Christ. We're so grateful for those of you who are gathered here at the northwest corner of LeMay and Trilby. You have come by car, on foot, and some of you even biked here this morning, which is amazing. What a beautiful morning for it. Uh, for those who are joining us online, um, we are also very grateful that you're here. Um, our worship is more complete because of your presence. Heart of the Rockies Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, welcomes into membership, full participation and leadership, all persons, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, identity and expression, sexual orientation, age, economic status, physical or mental ability, familial status, and faith history. For the health and safety of our uh, littlest ones who are not yet able to be vaccinated, but soon, soon, we hope. Um, we're not providing child care um, or children's church, but we do have worship activity bags. They're right in the back. Um, you don't have to be a kid to pick them up. If using your hands in worship helps you engage your head and your heart, please do help yourself. Uh, you're invited to take the bag home with you. You can leave the clipboard. We'll refill it for next week. You can share any prayer requests that you have in the journal. Donna is actually standing at the journal right at this moment, and Donna is going to be our prayer today. Uh, you can add your prayer requests there. If you're online, you can put them in the comments. Um, we won't pray for those in real time today, but we do check back. We pray for those prayer requests throughout the week, and we include them in our spoken prayers the following Sunday. We just ask that you share first names only for those prayer requests. Uh, restrooms are out the door and to your left. Uh, masks are required throughout the service. Um, you know the drill by now. They cover your mouth, they cover your nose. And when we're up here speaking, we'll take ours off um, so that you can hear us a little bit better. Thank you for your cooperation in that. It's meant that we've been able to worship in person safely um, since June. And gosh, I don't know about you, but that has done my heart some good. Um, for those who are worshiping, um, whether you're in person or online, uh, we don't have Bibles yet in the pews, but if you have a smartphone, you have a Bible, or you can bring your own. Um, the app that we like to use is called YouVersion. Um, I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version this morning, and our scripture reading for today is from John chapter 3. I missed being with you all last week. I was in Pittsburgh um, for a college teammate's wedding, thrice rescheduled due to COVID. Um, it was a wonderful party, um, a great time of joy and celebration. And I'm so very grateful um, to our pastoral assistant, Aaron, and our pastoral intern, Eric, and to all those who led in worship last week in my absence. Um, and it's so fun that I can still worship online, <laughs> even if not synchronously, when I'm not here. So that is a real gift too. Thank you to our tech team for making that possible. You might have noticed that our communion table looks a little bit different this morning. Today is World Communion Sunday, and World Communion Sunday um, is especially important to us as disciples because the Lord's Supper is so central to how we understand our relationship with God, our relationship with each other, and on a day like today, it reminds us that we are really in communion with Christians all across the world. And so today, um, we celebrate that gift of being part of the one body of Christ. Um, Normally, um, in a, in a pre-COVID time, we would have lots of different breads and juices for you to enjoy this morning in celebration of this day. Um, but because of COVID, we are celebrating a little bit differently. Um, back where Sue, our usher, is standing, um, we have some communion elements that are special to today and are special to our kids. Um, if you have been to church camp, you have probably had goldfish and grape juice communion. And so today you are invited to either receive those elements um, or to pick up our traditional elements in the back. Um, our ushers can help you out if you have any trouble opening them when we get to that point in the service. And you're always welcome to get up and help yourself as you need. I think that's all. Next up is my sermon and it's not time for that yet. So would you stand as you're able as we sing together?
Answer me when I call, O God of my right. You gave me room when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. How long, you people, shall my honor suffer shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? Selah. But know that the Lord has set apart the faithful for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. When you are disturbed, do not sin. Ponder it on your beds and be silent. Selah. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, Oh, that we might see some good. Let the light of your face shine on us, O Lord. You have put gladness in my heart, more than when their grain and wine abound. I will both lie down and sleep in peace. For you alone, O Lord, make me lie down in safety.
Would you be with me in the spirit of prayer? This morning, we ask for prayers for Ron and Laura, who want to thank the congregation, that's you, for all of their prayers and support. Ron does have another medical procedure coming up later this month, and would like us to keep um, them in prayer for that. Lord, hear our prayer. Prayers for Hannah, who was in a car accident and is recovering at MCR. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for our own Aaron, who is continuing to recover from having a kidney stone removed this week. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray prayers of thanksgiving for the birth of Charlotte to Holly and Micah. Um, and the big, uh, who are the parents, and Izzy, who is the big sister. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for all those who are affected by addictions and prayer for, prayers for their recovery. Lord, hear our prayer. Judy asks for prayers for her brother David, who lost his beloved wife this past week um, with a brief cancer diagnosis. Lord, hear our prayer. We ask prayers for Corey as he continues to work on settling affairs on the farm in Kansas after losing his mother. And for his daughter, Hope, who is doing okay, but is recovering uh, from a skateboarding accident this week. Um, nothing was broken, um, some pretty bad sprains. Um, so we, we lift uh, their family in prayer. Lord, hear our prayer. Holy One, you created all that is, each one of us unique, each one bearing your image and likeness. What a blessing to be one human family, diverse in so many exquisite ways. What a sacred honor that you call each one of us good and beloved. Holy ground of our being, we sense your presence with us and we give you thanks. Today, we celebrate the universal communion of the body of Christ. And we confess this body is suffering in many ways. For we have allowed ourselves to become divided because of our differences, rather than honoring and celebrating them and using them to strengthen the body. We are suffering many of life's challenges. Some of these we know we heap upon ourselves because of our fear and our pride and our greed. And some are simply beyond our power to control. So gracious God, we are yearning. We are yearning for answers, for healing, for peace. Help us learn to sit longer with the ancient and timeless question our holy scriptures ask of every person in every age. Who has been marginalized in the community? And who has been welcomed at your table? Help us to overcome our human propensity for mistreating our neighbors on the basis of things like age and gender and who they love or their physical and mental ability or ethnicity, culture, language or how educated someone is or what they do for a living or how much money they have or what their social status is. Come, Holy Spirit, Guide us as we struggle to live as Jesus taught us to live. 
We know hatred and division bring only corruption and death. We know we can't make the journey without your help. Help us to understand how we are divinely interconnected, how everybody belongs, how we are better and stronger together, and that we are called to love and serve one another. Replace our fear with courage and compassion. Give us eyes to see the humanity we share with those for whom we have little tolerance. Help us tell our stories with more truthfulness and listen more wholeheartedly to the stories of others. Equip us with self-awareness, humility, patience, and more than enough love and grace to build your beloved community. Merciful God, we lift our hearts in gratitude for the gift of life and the gifts of your limitless love and grace. We pray this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from For our kids who are joining us at home, if you want to go ahead and get a little bit closer to the screen, you can do that. And we're grateful for the kids that we have here, too. Um, so today is World Communion Sunday. And before we talk about the world part, let's talk for a minute about the communion part. So there are churches all over the world that celebrate communion which we also call the Lord's Supper, or in some traditions is called the Eucharist. Some churches call it Holy Communion. But whatever its name, it's a time when churches come together to remember the command that Jesus gave them, which is when you do this, remember me. When you eat bread together, when you share a common cup, remember me. So some churches, celebrate communion maybe once a quarter, like the church I did growing up. Some churches celebrate communion once a month. Some churches celebrate communion every single Sunday and sometimes even in between, like us. And that's part of what makes today so special as World Communion Sunday is that there are Christians all over the world, no matter when they would usually celebrate communion, on this first Sunday in October, they come to the Lord's table together. So for our prayer today, I want you to help me decide how we're going to pray and who we'll pray for. And to do that, I just need you to share the name of some places that you would like us to include in our prayers. So that could be a place that you've been. It could be a place that you want to go. It might be a place that you've just heard of. There is no place that is too big or too small or too close or too far away to include in our prayer this morning. So would you all help me with that? Would you name some places we can pray for today? You can just shout them out. And if you're online, you can put them in the chat. Would you say that? Thank you. Okay, let's see. Syria. Yes. South 
I've been there. Let's pray. God, we trust that you have heard the names of all these places that have been lifted up to you. Places that may be far away, but are near and dear to our hearts. Places that maybe we've only heard about on the news or seen pictures of. God, we know that you are always and you are everywhere. And so we know that you are already present to those in the places that we have lifted up in our prayer today. And we trust that you'll be near to us too. Thank you for giving us this gift of communion. That each time we break bread together and share from a cup, that we might be reminded of just how much you love each one of us. Not just here, in this time and in this place, but in all times and in all places. In the name of your son Jesus, we pray. Amen. Would you join me again in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We've been talking a lot about day and night, light and darkness. And so you should know that it was night when Nicodemus came into the dirt poor streets of Jerusalem to find Jesus. Now on the surface, it might have seemed like these two men would have some things in common. They were both religious leaders. Um, they both had people who were compelled by their teaching. Nicodemus would have stood out in the place he went to meet Jesus though. His nice cloak would have betrayed the privilege that came along with being part of the Sanhedrin, the ruling council of the temple in Jerusalem, sort of like the Supreme Court of the Jewish faith. Frederick Buechner called Nicodemus a VIP 
with a big theological reputation to uphold. There really would have been no good reason for a man like Nicodemus to visit an itinerant preacher like Jesus in the middle of the night. But just because Nicodemus was coming from a place of power and privilege didn't necessarily mean that the grass was greener where he was coming from. Pontius Pilate, Herod, and Caiaphas were running the show, and thanks to a rather recent arrangement uh, that brought this trio together, greed, corruption, displacement, and suffering were all part of the collective MO of what was happening in Nicodemus' world. Nicodemus, on the other hand, was a decent man. He kept up his position in the hopes that things would eventually get better, that people would pull together, that the core values of Judaism could be preserved and enacted in their nation. And yet Nicodemus was part of a fundamentally flawed and broken system. Not even his good intentions could save the people he desired to serve from suffering under the oppressive nature of the system and those calling the shots. And so Nicodemus found himself not only under the cover of night, but also right smack in the middle of what some might call a dark night of the soul. Barbara Brown Taylor reminds us that like darkness itself, the dark night of the soul can mean different things to different people. Now, some might use the phrase to describe a great loss while others might remember it as the time that is leading up to a difficult decision. However you have experienced a dark night of the soul, I think it's safe to say that you don't emerge from that time without your faith being severely tested, often by circumstances that seem totally beyond our control. We meet Nicodemus in John chapter 3. I'll read verses 1 through 21 from the New Revised Standard Version. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh. And what is born of spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses and you hear the sound of it, but you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him 
may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that God gave his only son and that so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. It doesn't end there. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world. And the people loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that, they, so that it may be seen clearly that their deeds have been done in God. The word of God for the people of God and the people said, thanks be to God. So I'm not sure that I've ever done this before, but I would like to offer an addendum to a sermon that I preached on March 8th, 2020 of which I would usually have absolutely no recollection, except that it was the last Sunday, BC, before COVID. The sermon text for that day was the same one that we're using today, and the sermon was, oh, so cleverly titled, Nick at Night, which, by the way, did you now know, includes friends. What happened? This seems like a big chronological leap from I Love Lucy, which is what it was when I was a kid. But anyway, in this Nick at Night, March 2020 sermon, I talked about the meaning of the word belief. I used theologian Debbie Thomas's definition, to believe is not to hold an opinion. To believe is to treasure, to hold something beloved, to give our hearts over to it without reservation. To believe in something is to invest in it with our love. I think that's still a good definition. It, it aligns very closely with the 16th century understanding of the word belief. Now for the addendum. If you've been reading along and learning to walk in the dark, we are jumping a few chapters ahead today. But Barbara Brown Taylor will eventually say that prior to the Enlightenment, to believe meant to set the heart upon or to, to give the heart to, as in, I believe in love. But then she goes on to explain that in the centuries following the Enlightenment, secular use of the words belief and believe began to change until they said less about the disposition of one's heart and more about the furniture in one's mind. By the 19th century, when knowledge about almost anything consisted primarily of empirical facts, belief started to become kind of the opposite of knowledge. A, a person's belief in God was reduced to their belief system. The unprovable statements of faith that person judged to be true, Taylor writes. Okay, but here's where it gets a little bit tricky because I don't know about you, but I kind of tend to conflate faith and belief. I feel sure I have used them interchangeably, although I'd have to go back to some even older sermons. But when we conflate faith and belief, we just might be limiting what faith can be. James Fowler, whose work has been read by many as seminarian and maybe some educators too, um, he says that when faith is reduced to a belief in creeds and doctrines, plenty of thoughtful people are going to decide that they no longer have faith. Now, they might hang on if they heard the word used to describe trust or loyalty in something beyond the self, but when they hear faith 
used to signify belief in a set formula of theological truths, the light in their eyes goes out. I mean, think about it. What if, what if when Nicodemus finally got off enough courage to go see Jesus in the middle of the night, and Jesus would have given him some sort of moral code or a, a set of rules to follow in response to Nicodemus's question. You think Nicodemus would have asked any more? Instead, Jesus told Nicodemus that he needed to be born from above. Now in John's gospel, being born from above and believing in Jesus are not so much about like an intellectual exercise, what one does with one's mind, so much as it's about what you do with your life, with your heart. Those who do what is true come to the light so it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God, John says. So if beliefs are the furniture in our mind that can trip us up, as Barbara Brown Taylor suggests, then, then I would say that faith is what allows us to continue navigating life even when we can't seem to find our way. Faith allows us to trust that God is still there even when we struggle to, to see or to experience God. It's like John talking about the wind. We can't always see it, but, but sometimes we can feel that it's there. Faith is what allows us to walk in the dark. Belief is too easy to stumble over. Well, just to make this a little more confusing, there's another John that I'm going to talk about today. He is a 16th century monk who is best known for his book, The Dark Night of the Soul, which he started writing while he was in a monastery prison for 11 months. I did not know that prisons existed in monasteries, but that is where he did some of his best work. And John of the Cross proclaims that the dark night is God's gift to you, intended for your liberation. It's about freeing you from your ideas about God, your fears about God, your attachment to all the beliefs you have been promised for believing in God your devotion to the spiritual practices that are supposed to make you feel closer to God, your dedication to doing and believing all the right things about God, your positive and negative evaluations of yourself as a believer in God, your tactics for manipulating God, and your sure cures for doubting God. All of these are substitutes for God. John of the Cross says, they all get in God's way. And he goes on to explain two different types of darkness. There's tiniblas, the kind of darkness that you want to get as far away from as you can. And there's oscura, which simply means to obscure. It's difficult to see in that kind of darkness. And God puts our lights out, John says, because we are never more in danger of stumbling than when we think we know where we are going. He basically says it's okay if some things are not fully known or fully seen by us. While Ben and I were trekking in Nepal during my 2018 sabbatical, we crossed paths with a large number of people from Poland who were trekking in honor of their country's 100th anniversary of regaining their independence. I think there were something like 400 people from Poland who made this trek over the course of the year. It is in the Guinness Book of World Records for the most number of people from one country to travel to Everest Base Camp <laughs> in a calendar year in case you were interested. But there's no place to feel freer than on the highest mountain on earth, they figure. 
So one night we ended up in a tea house where we and another couple from Colorado that we had just happened to meet along the way, uh, we were the only people in this tea house who were not from Poland. And in this particular group, there happened to be a priest. And since it was a Sunday evening, he conducted the mass. As the sun set and the darkness settled in, the priest approached our table and asked if we would be bothered by them having the service just right there in the dining hall. That was no problem, we assured him. I knew that I would not be allowed to partake in communion since I wasn't Catholic, but I was so drawn to the, the movement of the service from the, the intercessory prayer to the creed to the passing of the peace to the scripture reading to the homily to the consecration of the communion elements, no word of which I could understand, by the way, because <laughs> it was all in Polish, uh, that I went up to the priest when it was time for everyone to receive communion. Now, not wanting to put him in a difficult position, I explained that I was a pastor from the United States and that I just wanted to receive a blessing since I couldn't receive communion. And luckily for me, he spoke English. <laughs> and without hesitation, he offered me a blessing of which I understood exactly zero, except that it was intended for me. And it was given freely in faith that it would be what I needed it to be because it was of God. As the spontaneous congregation sang their closing hymn, I sat slurping my dull bot with our new friends and let myself just be enveloped by the music. Grateful that even though my view of the table is bigger and wider, neither of us tripped on the furniture on our way to a blessing.
ship sails cross the sea. Let the light shine down on this wayward ground. Let the light shine down on me. Let the A structure that was made of rusty sheet metal, tin, and cardboard. Children begging on the sidewalk. These were the memories that I took with me from a trip I took to Reynosa, Mexico. I will not say how many years ago when I went on a service project with a church. Our goal was to help this congregation in Reynosa, Mexico with a health clinic for the community, uh, with building and fortifying their church building and helping in any way we could. I had never been out of the United States before, and yet we traveled by bus all the way down through Texas, through McAllen, and across the border 12 miles into Mexico. 12 miles into Mexico. There was incredible poverty. There were people suffering, hungry. And when I realized the difference between my life and their lives, I could do nothing but weep and feel for the very first time in my life so very privileged. As that week wrapped up, we had a celebration together. People who probably knew more English than we knew Spanish. And we had a wonderful feast in which uh, the, the people of Reynosa in this congregation made the best tamales I have ever in my entire life, smelled or eaten, and this cream sauce that was like guacamole. I'm not, never mind. Okay. And they shared with us what they had. And it was a sacrifice for them. And yet they wanted to show us love and they wanted to show us appreciation. And for those moments, our communion together was tamales and guacamole sauce and homemade sweet tea. Why do I share that story? Well, because today is World Communion Day. World Communion Day, for those of you who don't know, and I'm going to be honest, my tradition doesn't really celebrate, you know, my former life in the church, World Communion Day, great. Well, since becoming a part of this congregation, communion, and specifically World Communion Day, has come to mean so much to me. Because this is the day, the first Sunday in every October, where we come together as a congregation, but not only us, we recognize the fact that there are believers in Reynosa. 
that there are believers in Mali in a mud hut. That there are believers in Greece in a cathedral. There are believers in South Louisiana in a church. And we are all together celebrating in unity what the Lord has done for us. And I'm so thankful this morning. Today, we come together from every culture and we break bread together and we drink the cup together. Or in this case, in our congregation, we have the holy goldfish and the holy grape, is it juice or drink? Anyway, beverage. And I like what Aaron, uh, Pastor Aaron told me earlier this week that we do this this morning because this is symbolic of the fact that it doesn't matter what age, we all come together to remember it doesn't matter your faith background, it doesn't matter your position in life, whether you're questioning or you've been a person of faith for X number of years, everyone Everyone is welcome to this table this morning. Why? Because God welcomes everyone. And so as we remember this morning, we remember in unity the night Jesus was betrayed. And he took the bread. And we have a beautiful display here. We have tortillas. We have bread. We have different kinds of bread. We have a cup. But on the night Jesus was betrayed, it's so pretty, I don't want to break it. <laughs> he took the bread and he broke it with his disciples. There, it's broken. And he said, do this in remembrance of me. And he took the cup. And he said, drink this. This is my body. This is my blood. I do this for you. And the disciples, I don't think, had a glimpse of what <laughs> was really about to happen. He did this for us. And so as a believer, as a congregation, as a world, together today, we remember. We proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. God, we solemn our hearts this morning. And we remember. And God, today is World Communion Day. And it's a day that we have chosen to celebrate with the entire world the gift you've given us. And not only that, but in a solemn, sober way, we remember your sacrifice. And God, just as we celebrate with people halfway around the world, I, as one man in Christ, in a very personal way today, express to you thanks. The fact that we live in this world, I live in this world, and I have a God that loves me in a very personal way. God, I'm overwhelmed. Thank you for your gift. Thank you for your sacrifice. Be exalted, O oh God. Amen.
the disadvantage of glasses and a mask. Um, offering. When I was 13, I was asked, will you support the church with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, and your services? And I said, I will. I want to thank all of you for your offering to my family over these last few weeks, your prayers. They had a great deal of impact. And when my family learned that this community had offered up themselves in prayer, in support, they felt truly blessed. And I want to thank you. So often when we talk about offering, we talk about the physical world. Um, Gordon, if you'd go ahead and put up, oh, am I talking about the wrong thing? No. Okay. That's just a reminder. Okay. Um, Gordon, do we st still have a slide on uh, how to contact and, and give to the church financially? Yeah, okay, there we are. Uh, to keep the railroad running is what I call this. Keep the railroad running. It's not the railroad. It's not what the railroad does, but it's keep the railroad running. Um, in times of offering, I want to follow up with what you've given me. And what I learned when I was in Charleston, South Carolina with family from all over the country and talking to uh, my sister-in-law's dear friends and their concern about those of us who are going through the dark night of the soul with depression. And so the offering I'm asking you today to do is when you go home, sit down, take a few minutes, close your eyes, and as my dad would say, take three deep breaths, and then ask the question, Lord, who needs me today? And listen, and follow his advice. Amen. Please stand as you are able and join us. We know that our ministry is not limited to this time and to this place. And so today on World Communion Sunday, um, as you have the opportunity to purchase some coffee, some chocolate, some tea, 
There are probably other goodies out there too from Equal Exchange. Um, we are grateful for this partnership that allows us to support small farmers um, who are growing their crops sustainably and who are receiving a fair wage for their work all over the world. And so today we have a short video to share with you um, that reminds you of the impact that drinking coffee and eating chocolate can have. Equal Exchange was started to build supply chains that work for small farmers to make enough money so that they can stay where they live and cultivate products in a healthy way and one that respects the planet, putting heart and soul and sweat into the best products they can make. Produciendo el cacao, me siento bien. ¿Eh? Uno, contribuyo al desarrollo del país. Dos, aumenta mi producción económica. Tres, que se ve el <laughs> Muy bien. Ya este está listo para el chocolate. Yeah. The people who make our products possible, going and spending time with them in their homes, on their farms. I get to sit down with the cooperatives that we work with and say, you have a blank slate. What are the projects you've dreamed of that will help your cooperative to grow and to innovate? And how can we help you to do that? Vienen aquí personas de Equal Exchange a compartir con productores y con el equipo técnico. Entonces es como una hermandad. Nos ha ayudado a mejorar eh, los procesos en términos de, de calidad. Eso garantiza la sostenibilidad en, en el tiempo. What does Equal Exchange mean to me? It means Fátima in Nicaragua. It means Angélica in Colombia all of the farmers struggling and fighting and equal exchange means the, the world to me from the point of origin through to the finished product. I always think of the farmers when I go back to my desk in the U.S. and I want to talk about the care and expertise that goes into the products and the change that can be built over time when you support Equal Exchange. I know these people, I'm fighting for these people I'm out in the market, um, you know, trying to tell their story. Lo que ellos están pagando un poquito más por el producto de comercio justo tiene real efecto positivo llegando principalmente al productor. You're the ones who make this whole experiment work, and you're the ones through your purchases who are demonstrating that this is a viable way to run a business. You can take a stance with your purchases, and that's really powerful. you needed any convincing to buy chocolate and coffee. Um, as you leave today, um, we hope that you will stay for our congregational meeting. So this is just as you leave the sanctuary, um, you're invited to share your offerings, uh, to dispose of your trash, and we do still have copies of Learning to Walk in the Dark in the lobby. I think we've sold through every stack we've put out, but there's still more. So um, if you're interested in reading along with Barbara Brown Taylor's book that is the basis for our Learning to Walk in the Dark sermon series, you can still pick that up. Um, as Chris reminded us, the reconciliation offering is also still being received today. Um, there are special envelopes for that um, in the back and also out in the lobby. Um, the reconciliation ministry is one of our church-wide ministries that you heard about last Sunday um, that is committed um, to the to human flourishing for all people in all communities. And our regional expression of that is our regional reconciliation ministry team. Uh, Donna Green serves on that team, Joanne Johnson and Kate Cooley from our congregation. Um, and to stay up to date with the work that they do, you can either go to the region's website or we post updates that they share with us in our weekly together at heart email. Um, we invite you as you go today, again, not too far because we have a congregational informational meeting, uh, to pass the peace. Um, you might want to do that from a distance. 
I know those who are worshiping online love to see you all, so feel free to pass some peace to them on your way out. For those who have felt a call um, to baptism today or to joining the journey of faith that you are on with the one that we share here at Heart of the Rockies, we just want to pray with a pastor or an elder. Um, there will be a brief time in which you can grab a drink if you need and go to the bathroom before the congregational informational meeting, but grab me in that time. I would love to hear from you and we'd be happy to have an elder pray with you. Um, we'd love to connect with those of you who are worshiping online as well. Uh, go to heartoftherockies.org slash connect um, for an opportunity to share confidential prayer requests with us, to let us know that you're considering baptism or membership, um, or simply just to request more information about who and how we are at Heart of the Rockies Christian Church. Stacy, is there anything else? They need to know about the Congregational Informational Meeting happening right after worship. Great. So agendas and hard copies of some of the things we'll share in the meeting will be available in the back. For those who would like to join us online, there is a Zoom link that went out in an email on Friday. It also was in yesterday's worship email. So we'd love to have you join us via Zoom if you're not able to be here in person. Would you stand and join me in a good word for going? God, be with us this week. We'll see you in other faces, hear you in other voices, love you in loving others, serve you in serving others, not conformed to this world, but transformed by your love.